If there was only one way you could describe King of the Hill, it would be slice of life. There are no grand adventures or huge battles, it's just a show about people living their lives and the relationships they have with each other, and that's why we love it. But as simple as life is in Arlen, Texas, it doesn't stop antagonistic and even low-key evil characters from creeping in every once in a while. But which King of the Hill characters happen to fall on the low end of the morality spectrum, and which are the worst of the worst? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is King of the Hill Villains Bad to Evil. When we say villain, we mean antagonist. Like we said, King of the Hill is simple and grounded, so you're not going to find any supervillains or world conquerors. For this list, along with focusing on morality and actions, we're also going to be focusing on how much trouble they put other characters through. Naturally, those characters who had multiple appearances or who committed multiple crimes will receive a higher ranking. With that out of the way, we're going to be starting with our least evil characters and working our way down to the truly evil villains. Starting with our least evil character, we have Dale Gribble. Dale is not a bad guy. In fact, he's just as often a protagonist as he is an antagonist. However, with how many crimes he's committed and how often he's causing trouble for his friends, we felt we couldn't not put him somewhere on this list. When looking at Dale's rap sheet, it's concerning how long it is, with crimes ranging from minor to major. To start, Dale is the type of guy to act first and ask for permission later. He's constantly trying to borrow Hank's tools without asking, and even digs a friendship tunnel under Hank's home, causing the floor underneath it to collapse. Dale is also a schemer, and can be pretty dishonest at times. We all know about his rusty Shackleford alias, which is not only an example of him trying to get out of consequences, but also an example of identity theft. There was also the time he planted ants on Hank's lawn after Hank fired him. Most of the time, though, Dale is a huge jerk. He becomes a terror to his neighborhood when he gets a suit of armor, seeing himself as invincible and thus able to act without consequences. In fact, any time Dale gets a little power, it goes straight to his head. As bad as Dale can be, he can also be good. For all the times he's been a jerk or sneaky or irresponsible, he's also been noble, brave, and selfless. For that reason alone, we just had to rank him as least evil. Shusha! Slightly above Dale, we have Gordon Huskin. Gordon and his family were part of an international house swap program, temporarily moving into Boomhauer's house for the summer. Contrary to the popular stereotype, Gordon and his family weren't exactly polite or neighborly. Both Gordon and his wife Maureen are condescending, even when Hank and Peggy are just trying to be neighborly. Maureen insults Peggy's gift basket and new lawn furniture, while Gordon insults Alamo Beer and disrespects Boomhauer's mug, leaving it in a bush when he leaves the Hills party. Tensions further rise when Gordon calls the police on Hank and Peggy, filing an unnecessary noise complaint. Throughout the episode, Gordon remains stubborn as the friction continues between him and Hank, culminating in drunk lawn mowing. But even after Hank tries to make things right and gets Gordon out of jail, Gordon and his family don't seem to show much appreciation for Hank's sacrifice. Gordon even gives one last subtle Texas jab on his way out. Talk about rude. Though we acknowledge that Hank didn't make the situation any better, Gordon was the one who started the initial conflict. Still, there are much worse crimes than being a bad neighbor. Up next is Ted Wasanasong. For someone as rich and successful as Ted, it's only natural that he would tend to use that influence in sometimes unscrupulous ways. While Ted acknowledges Khan's admiration for him, he usually doesn't show that same respect towards him in return. In one instance, Ted even tried to use his influence over Khan to get him to stop being a banana and instead live a more traditional Laotian lifestyle. You become what is known as a banana. This culminated in Ted trying to get Khan to join a guerrilla squad to fight the communist regime in Laos, where Khan likely would have been injured, captured, or killed. In another episode, Ted tried to use both Khan and Hank to get a famous golf tournament at Nine Rivers Country Club. Although he was willing to offer many perks to both of them, it was also obvious that Ted didn't care about being actual friends with them, not even paying attention enough to know what Hank's job was. Later on, he and his wife tried to trick Peggy into selling kitchen appliances in order to get out of their contract with Cozy Kitchens. This once again shows Ted as trying to use someone else for their own gain, with his wife apparently sharing the same tendencies. And Ted can be reckless, like when he tried to build a McMansion on Rainy Street without any regards to how such a massive and poorly built home would affect its neighbors. Add in the fact that he lets his son be a bully to students like Bobby, and Ted doesn't seem like a guy worthy of all the admiration and respect Khan gives him. 
Next is Anthony Page. CPS workers are not bad people, far from it. Unfortunately, Kenneth is an example of a person who puts his own opinions and beliefs before actual evidence. For most, he's gullible and irrational for how he reacts towards the people he perceives as victims. In the pilot episode, Anthony's brought in after Bobby gets a black eye from getting hit by a baseball. From this event, a town-wide rumor gets blown completely out of proportion, and Hank is accused of being abusive towards his son. When Anthony checks out the situation, it's clear that he's already decided Hank is guilty and doesn't give Hank much of a chance to explain himself. He even accuses Hank of being abusive to Peggy. As the episode goes on, Anthony continues trying to take Bobby away without any real evidence, only using the impressions Bobby and Joseph do of Hank as proof. Despite this, there was still a chance of Anthony taking Bobby away. That is, until his boss asked him if he actually spoke to Bobby's baseball coach to confirm Hank's story, which he didn't. This is another example of Anthony only relying on his own opinions rather than facts. Not the best quality for a social worker. While the pilot is his biggest role, Anthony also plays a brief antagonistic role in the episode Junkie Business, where he helps Leon Petard maintain employment at Strickland Propane, where he claims that Leon's addiction to drugs falls under a disability. Like a lot of bureaucrats, Anthony is someone who's just annoying to deal with and causes more problems rather than fixing them. Next is the very frustrating Caleb. We're sure a lot of you may be upset that he isn't lower on our list, but let us explain. When he and his family first moved in, Caleb actually wasn't that bad of a kid. Maybe a little annoying, but it was all typical little kid behavior. However, once Caleb realized he could easily get a rise out of Hank, it didn't take him long to go from relatively innocent to actively taunting him. It gets to the point of Caleb being destructive. He shoves a hose through Hank's mail slot, which would have caused a lot of water damage if Hank hadn't spotted it right away. And then he purposely rides his bike on Hank's lawn to wreck it. So Caleb turned out to be a brat. This was mostly the fault of his parents, not being willing to discipline him or give him boundaries. In that sense, his actions can't completely be blamed on him. We should also point out that once Caleb's dad actually stepped up and told him to stop, Caleb obeyed. For these reasons, we can't place him any lower. Next is Liz Strickland. It's hard not to sympathize with Ms. Liz, considering who she's married to. When Buck's cheating finally becomes too much for her, Liz takes it upon herself to take everything from Buck, including Strickland propane. Wanting revenge on her husband, Liz used her new authority to control Hank. At one point, Liz even tried to seduce Hank into a romantic scenario when she lied about her hot tub having a propane issue. It's hypocritical when you think about it. She was only acting out because she was tired of Buck's cheating, yet she tried to get Hank to cheat on Peggy with her. It's messed up. Her new position also gave her a chance to get revenge on Buck's mistress, Debbie. It should be noted, however, that Liz was never cruel or abusive to Debbie. At worst, she would assign Debbie the worst jobs, which is a fair punishment. Yes, but your butt belongs to me. While we disapprove of her trying to hook up with Hank for the sake of getting back at her husband, this was one bad call that she still apologized for. Compared to some of the other characters on this list, Liz did a lot less, and we feel we can cut her some slack. Next is Strickland's main rival, M.F. Thatherton. The M.F. stands for… you know what it is. The M.F. stands for… My friend! Formerly an employee of Strickland Propane, Thatherton was an example of disloyalty by deciding to strike out on his own behind his boss's back, something Hank disapproved of. As his own boss, Thatherton can be underhanded and untrustworthy in his attempts to get a sale. Because he only sees his customers as a means of making money, Thatherton says whatever he needs to in order to dazzle someone enough for them to buy, even if it's a lie. He engages in a price war with Strickland to have the lowest propane prices in Ireland, though he will make a deal and illegally work together with his competition if it means bigger profits for him. Essentially, he's the complete opposite of a salesman as honest and transparent as Hank is. While he is as bad, perhaps even worse, than Buck Strickland, Thatherton isn't a main antagonist often, only having a few main roles. He's also a huge liar and con man, not exactly a criminal genius. As such, we felt we couldn't place him much lower. Next, we have Patch Boomhauer. Acting as a foil to his older brother, Patch is a womanizer and sleazy. Even after being engaged to Boomhauer's former girlfriend, Patch cozies up to female entertainers on the night of his bachelor party. While Boomhauer seems to respect his dates, Patch doesn't seem to have much at all, judging by how he treats Luann when all she does is walk up to him. 
He can also be dishonest, letting Boomhauer take the fall for him and claiming that Boomhauer hired the party's entertainment. Patch only reveals the truth later on when he thinks it can benefit him. While he only appeared in one episode, Patch made it very clear why he and his older brother don't get along. Acting as the stereotypical dumb hillbilly, we have Jimmy Witchard. Jimmy's loud, angry, and above all else, stupid. As the manager of the Arlen Speedway concession stand, he often drove his young co-workers away with his ridiculous demands and refusal to give them proper payment. When Bobby tried to be the best employee he could be, it didn't take Jimmy very long to take advantage of Bobby's work ethic. But even when Bobby was doing things right, Jimmy offered little in praise and was verbally abusive towards him. In addition, he had Bobby do awful jobs that no kid should do, like forcing him to wear a hot dog costume in the hot sun, resulting in Bobby getting pelted with trash. Jimmy even tried to force Bobby to run across a busy racetrack so he wouldn't have to wait for a drink. While this is his only major role, it's still memorable. Because he was selfish and stupid enough to let a 12-year-old boy nearly be killed, we felt we had to put him fairly low down. In terms of ex-wives, Lenore was one of the worst. While she and Bill were still married, Lenore cheated on him several times before leaving him during the holidays. As Bill said, she didn't even leave him a Dear John letter, having so little concern for him that she refused to even say goodbye or give him closure. Each time Bill tried to reach out, she would reject him, even when he was desperate to hear from her. The only time she responded was when she learned that Bill was happy and moving on. When Bill starts to date former Governor Ann Richards, Lenore tries to win Bill back. Whether this is out of jealousy or because she's petty enough to ruin Bill's first healthy relationship in years, it's still awful. While she may make Bill feel hopeful that his wife has finally returned, in the end, Lenore makes it obvious that once Anne is out of the picture, she'll go back to not caring about Bill at all, and that she was only ever pretending to care. It's one thing to break someone's heart, but to go out of your way to ruin a person's future relationships, that's a whole new level of cruelty. Next on our list, we have the not-so-holy Junie Harper. We all know those types of people who will use their religions as a means of power and control over others, and Junie Harper fits that type to a T. In her only appearance, Junie tried to ban Halloween and Arlen, claiming that it was a satanic holiday. Despite this claim being completely unfounded, she still cancels the holiday and gets a chance to hold a hallelujah house for the town's kids. The house in question is, essentially, filled with propaganda, with its displays promoting things like abstinence and anti-evolution beliefs. Throughout the episode, she also tries to turn Luann and later Bobby against Hank, crossing the line from concerned individual to active antagonist, one that can't seem to stop pushing her beliefs onto others. She even goes as far as to say that Hank and Peggy are promoting anti-Christian values, which is out of line. Overall, Junie Harper is a perfect example of an extremist, caring more about the control she has over others and getting rid of things she doesn't personally like than the actual core meaning of her religion. Starting our actual criminals, we have Bill's so-called son, Wally. During one Christmas, Bill decides he wants to be Santa for as many kids as possible. This goes beyond buying a gift for children in need, and results in Bill turning his home into Santa's workshop. Once the holidays are over and the kids stop coming, Bill runs into Wally, a teenage slacker that quickly mooches off Bill's generosity. He tries to get money, cigarettes, and beer out of Bill, who starts to see Wally as a surrogate son. Things get worse when Wally gives Bobby and the other neighborhood kids beer, and steals Hank's belt sander to give to Bill, proving himself to be both a bad influence and a thief. Wally's stint as Bill's so-called son ends when he gets arrested for stealing both Bill's car and credit card. Afterwards, Wally enlists in the army, thanks to Bill convincing the judge that that would be better than jail. Though his crimes are minor, they're still awful. It's also implied that had it not been for Hank stepping in and Bill standing up to him, Wally would have taken Bill for all he was worth. We can only hope that being in the army straightened him out, for both his and Bill's sake. He never had faith in me either, but at least he had a motorcycle. Yet another so-called redneck, we're ranking Elvin Mackleston next. We first see Elvin in the redneck on Rainy Street, where he tries to convince a frustrated Khan to ditch his responsibilities and live a more free lifestyle. Although Elvin was just trying to help out, he did it in a very destructive way. It was his advice that nearly caused Khan and men to lose their home. At one point, he even tries to convince Khan to rob a CD store with them, not caring about the consequences. 
he also proved to have very little actual respect for Khan, making fun of him after men said she'd had enough of the redneck lifestyle. All hail, this is ridiculous. In addition to all of this, Alvin has been violent when he threatened Kevin, a 15-year-old boy that Luann decided to go to prom with, for the sake of his friend Lucky. Elvin even says that he and Mud Dauber will kill Kevin if he goes to the dance with Luann and makes good on his word when they crash the high school prom. We're sure that Elvin has done more, but without many more actual scenes to go off of, we can't put him any lower. Next is King Philip. It's easy for people to let a title or a crown go to their head, even if that crown is plastic and that title only applies to a small renaissance fair. The so-called King Philip is a perfect example of this. Striving for historical accuracy in his renaissance fair, Philip treats all of his female employees terribly. He underpays them, forces them to do backbreaking labor in uncomfortable corsets, and has them put in a literal stockade when they get out of line. He also threatens to fire them if they try to fight back, a punishment that none of the workers can afford. There's being a terrible boss, and then there's being a tyrant. Thankfully, by the end of the episode, King Philip gets his comeuppance when the women sue him for all the labor laws he broke, resulting in him losing his renaissance fair and his so-called kingdom once and for all. Next is Cotton Hill. Yeah, you knew he had to be somewhere. Honestly, where do we even start? Cotton is pretty much the textbook example of an emotionally abusive husband and father. He was unsupportive and disrespectful to both of his wives, and the way he treated Hank was even worse. Even when Hank is an adult, Cotton puts him down and gives even less respect to Peggy, who he only calls Hank's wife. Throughout his life, he was consistently a chauvinistic, violent, abusive, and intolerant character. Cotton even tried to pass on some of his more misogynistic traits to Bobby, proving to be a terrible influence on him. For his worst moments, Cotton once locked Bobby in a cell for three days while they were at a military academy, trying to break his spirit and toughen him up. During another point in the series, Cotton tried to use Hank as a fall guy when he tried to assassinate Fidel Castro. Well, I suppose you're sucker punch! As awful as Cotton has been, he has had several moments throughout the series where he showed his softer side. Despite our earlier examples, Cotton has loved and cared about Bobby, as well as his other son, G.H. When Bobby accidentally burnt down the church, Cotton took the blame after Bobby revealed the truth to him. Despite their hatred of each other, he helped Peggy regain the ability to walk after her skydiving accident, and he once told Hank that out of the two of them, Hank was the better dad. Cotton was even once willing to take his own life if it meant he could provide for his family through the life insurance money. It should also be noted that as emotionally and verbally abusive as Cotton is, he never crossed that line into being physical. He even seemed to be appalled when he thought Hank put Peggy into a full body cast. We acknowledge that it's a low bar, but it's one that Cotton clears regardless. Up next is Hoyt Platter. When Hoyt makes his grand return to Arlen, it's obvious that when it comes to being a parent to his daughter Luann, he's about as bad as his ex-wife. It's revealed that Hoyt has been in prison for several years, and though he may claim that he wants to go straight, old habits die hard. Not only is he a terrible father to Luann and a bad influence on Bobby and Lucky, but he robs a diner only days after coming to Arlen. He then convinces Lucky to take the fall for him, not regretting his choice, despite the pain it puts Luann through. Later, he steals money from Peggy to buy drugs and accuses his pregnant daughter of buying the drugs when he's arrested yet again. As awful as Hoyt is, we put him above his ex, Leanne, for a couple of reasons. Hoyt may be a thief and a liar, but he's never violent. Also, while it may only be a small amount, he still seems to care about Luann more than Leanne does. Though it's not enough to keep him out of the lower half of our ranking, it's enough to earn him a couple of points. Entering our bottom 10, we have Buck Strickland. In terms of horrible, womanizing bosses and just horrible people in general, Buck is a definition of one. While he may have been a confident businessman, Buck's vices have gotten the better of him over the years. He's a cheater, a womanizer, and can be found at the local strip club instead of his office. Buck also follows less than honest business practices if he thinks he's able to get away with it, like when he engaged in working together with his competition. Despite Hank's loyalty to Strickland, Buck isn't always loyal to him. He once tried to frame Hank for the murder of Debbie Grun to throw suspicion off both himself and his wife. Granted, he also tried to pin the blame on himself when it looked like pinning the blame on Hank wouldn't work, all for the sake of protecting Liz. It was an action Hank understood and forgave him for, but it was one of his lowest moments. Sorry about that whole frame up there, Tano. I was under a lot of stress. Buck was also a terrible influence on Bobby in the episode where Bobby became his golf caddy. 
He tries to instill the lesson that it's only cheating if you get caught into Bobby, and later puts Bobby in danger when he takes him to Arkansas for a night. Hank was completely fed up with Buck in this episode. What keeps Buck from going any lower is that while he has tried to throw Hank under the bus a couple of times, he's also stood by Hank and helped him out. Buck acknowledges that his business is nothing without Hank and will do whatever he needs to keep him around. Up next, we have Barry Rollins. You know the Joker's old saying of how one bad day can turn an ordinary person into a life of crime? Well, that's what happened to Barry Rollins, albeit on a smaller scale. According to Barry, he was someone who had been pushed around most of his life. This misfortune came to a head when his wallet was stolen by Hank, who believed that the wallet was his and that Barry was a thief. Tired of being a victim, Barry takes out all of his frustrations on Hank, even as Hank is just trying to return his wallet. He tries to bash Hank, Bill, and Boomhauer's heads in with an aluminum baseball bat and chases them all the way to Bazooms. Barry continues to threaten and attack them, even getting physical with a few of the waitresses that get in his way. Although we do feel sorry for him, we can't deny that he's unstable, seemingly getting a thrill out of being a revenge-seeking vigilante. Given that he's one of the few King of the Hill characters that committed attempted murder, we had to give him a low ranking. Please! I'm tired of being a victim! Up next, we're ranking Coach Sowers. Earning the nickname Sour Coach Sowers, Coach Sowers was known for being strict and serious, especially when it came to football. When Hank asked him to turn the middle school football team into a team of winners, Sowers refused to give the kids any leeway despite their ages. He applied brutal, relentless practices meant for high school students rather than middle school students, leading many players to quit and join the soccer team. We can't blame the kids for this, given how often Sowers' training methods resulted in the kids either getting injured or eating mud. Sowers didn't care about these issues, being verbally abrasive and always telling kids to have a salt tablet, regardless of how much pain they were in. His coaching methods were finally taken too far for even Hank to take, when Hank found him chasing the team around his car for motivation, threatening to hit them if they weren't fast enough. This guy's nuts. What makes him even worse is that these were close to the same methods he used back in his high school coaching days. In another episode, Hank and the others talked about how Coach Sowers used to give them go pills, aka horse crank. According to Bill, these pills were strong enough that when he broke his leg during a game, he didn't realize it for two days. So while Sowers may have never been arrested for a crime during the show or during his coaching career, it's very obvious to anyone that he was a danger to young athletes and probably society. We're gonna have Alabaster just outside our bottom five. Given his career, it should be obvious why Alabaster is this high. Being from Oklahoma City, he came down to Arlen when he thought Hank had stolen Tammy from him and was willing to fight him to get her back. Given how confident Alabaster is and the influence that he has in Oklahoma City, we can assume that he's used to threatening people and has a habit of shaking people down for cash. When Hank refuses to give up Tammy, Alabaster chases them and tries to ram them off the road, running a red light in the process. He ran a red, you can't do that! That last bit may seem minor compared to everything else, but Hank sees it as a big offense. Ultimately, despite Tammy's claims that Alabaster can mess a guy like Hank up, it doesn't take much for Alabaster to back down. For this, we can't put him lower, although he certainly does enough crime, both implied and on screen, to earn this spot. Several notches below her ex-husband, we have Leanne Platter. While Hoyt might have been selfish and uncaring, Leanne not only took selfishness to a new level, but she was also violent. In case you need a reminder, Leanne was sent to jail after stabbing Hoyt with a fork. After that, she was ordered by court not to drink. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for her to give in to temptation and for her alcoholism to cause her to neglect her motherly duties. She was verbally and physically abusive to Bill shortly after they started dating. Her anger issues reached a breaking point when, after Luann's then-boyfriend Buckley insulted her, she threatened to stab him with, what else, a fork. While Peggy was able to fight her off, Leanne abandoned her daughter once again stealing Bill's truck in the process. Leanne shows no remorse for any of her awful actions, not caring about the pain, physical or otherwise, that she inflicts on others, and thus more than deserves a low spot on our list. Next, we're ranking former football player Willie Lane. Forever known for blocking a kick in a Super Bowl, Willie has let his star status go to his head. Although he started off friendly when he first moved on to Rainy Street, Willie quickly proved himself to be not only a bad neighbor, but destructive. 
When Khan complains about the noise his party's making, Willie cuts his phone line, and it just gets worse from there. From trying to ruin Khan's lawn as revenge, to keeping the entire neighborhood up with his parties, to destroying Hank's fence, Willie lets everyone know that he doesn't care about being a good neighbor. He uses his status as a football star to influence and manipulate the cops, and he eventually ends up punching Hank in the face. After this, we learn that Willie actually has two other assault charges. Not only is he an obnoxious jerk, but he's also a violent jerk. He has zero good qualities, and the only reason why he isn't on the podium of evil is because our bottom three entries are even worse than him. Taking the bronze medal of evil is the entirety of Omega House. Because we have no idea who started Omega House, we thought that we had to put the entire group on our list, even if most of the members are victims themselves. Basically, Omega House is a cult disguised as a female sorority, brainwashing its members through a variety of means. This includes depriving them of protein, bathroom breaks, and contact with all friends and family, hazing, and forcing them to sell jams and jellies for the cult's profit. It's disturbing to see how the group takes in young women and strips them of their identity, leaving an impact on their victims even if they're eventually able to escape. Their method of brainwashing is messed up too, and we see how much it distresses Luann. Although their group is broken up, thanks to the power of stakes, and doesn't seem to have much of a negative impact on the rest of Arlen, we can still infer that the group caused plenty of mental damage to its victims while it was active. Also, Peggy and Luann were both nearly kidnapped and taken to a so-called retreat, when in actuality, they would have been taken into slavery on a Jams and Jellies ranch. That alone is more than enough to consider them pretty evil. For the silver medal of evil, we have Trip Larson, another character that we're sure you all knew was coming. It was only natural to include a character like him. Though originally charming, he seems to have something dark about him, something that only Peggy can sense. Throughout the episode, he subtly manipulates and influences people like Luann and Hank while subtly, and not so subtly, threatening Peggy. Once he has Luann in his home, he tries to control how she acts as well as both her clothes and her hair, even dying and cutting it while she's asleep. This all comes to a head when Trip tries to force Luann into marrying a stranger. If only he can recreate the happy Larson's Pork Products mascot family he saw throughout his childhood. When Luann refuses, he chases her down in a rage, with the two of them eventually ending up in a slaughterhouse. Trip then brings Luann up on the assembly line and decides that since she doesn't want to follow his plans, then they'll die together. While Luann is able to get the safety, Trip isn't so lucky. Now, we're sure you're all wondering why Trip isn't our most evil. While we acknowledge that Trip did awful things and is the darkest character from King of the Hill, we can't be sure that his actions were completely his own. It's implied that Trip suffered from several mental illnesses, and it's only when he's shocked by a prod that his mental stability is restored. He even asked why he was in a pig costume, further implying that he wasn't in his right mind and that, had he survived, he likely wouldn't have been the same type of controlling and, let's face it, crazy man we saw throughout the episode. Because his actions weren't genuine, we felt that we couldn't give him the bottom spot. Finally, for our gold medal of evil, we have Debbie Grund. While she may have started off as Buck's mistress, Debbie soon revealed that she had a dark side and was willing to do much worse than just sleeping with a married man. When Strickland Propane is taken over by Liz, Debbie reveals that she never cared about Buck and was only sleeping with Buck to get special privileges at work. With Hank now being the closest thing she has to a boss that doesn't hate her, Debbie tries to seduce and force herself onto Hank. When Hank rejects her, this is when she puts her plans into action. First, Debbie tries to blackmail Hank into sleeping with her, threatening to tell Peggy that he cheated on her. What caused her to finally snap was when she saw the Stricklands had made up. Wanting to get her revenge once and for all, Debbie stole Ms. Liz's shotgun and hid in a dumpster behind Sugarfoot's with the intention of shooting both Buck and Liz, and possibly Hank and Peggy. Although she was unable to put her plans into action due to accidentally shooting herself, the murderous intent was there. Really, just the fact that she was even willing to go as far as murder, while also being a seductor and a cheater, was more than enough to declare her as the most evil King of the Hill villain. Before we go, we wanted to hand out some extra medals to the characters that fit them the best. We're giving the Darwin Medal to Jimmy Wichard. Need we remind you all that Jimmy apparently fried his brain by staring into the sun? The Lust Medal, of course, goes to Buck Strickland. It was a hard toss-up between him and Patch, but we felt Buck earned it in the end due to his many, many examples of cheating and sleeping around. We're giving the Wrath Medal to Barry Rollins. 
Not too many characters on this show threaten to murder someone else just for a simple mistake, and Barry certainly goes above and beyond with his wrath. The greed medal is gonna have to go to Hoyt Platter for being willing to steal money, time, and time again. Some guys just don't learn. We have to give the pride medal to Junie Harper for just how much she seems to see herself as the only righteous person in Arlen, and thus has the ability to judge everyone else for their so-called sins. The sloth medal goes to Wally for just being such a mooch when it came to Bill's generosity and essentially being forced into a career path through the army. Lastly, we're giving the gluttony medal to Leanne Platter. Violently lashing out might have been one of her vices, but her addiction to alcohol was certainly her biggest. Okay, that's our list. Let us know in the comment section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite cartoons, shows, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.